Apologies for the ever so slight delay for the Sunrise Safari. My name is Scott and I'm teamed up with Brian Joubert and his famous thumb on camera. Now, we are searching for the Inkahuma Pride of Lion. The Brent and Brian have both heard them calling somewhere here on Juma, but we're not too sure where. When you do hear lion audio from in a kind of enclosed area like the Juma Research Camp where we stay, it can be difficult to pinpoint exactly where it is. But they are full of baby zebra that they fed on last night, for those of you who missed the sunset safari. And because the Juma Waterhole camera has been out of operation uh, last night, I want to just check there to make sure they haven't come to quench their thirst after feeding. And um, failing that, we'll head south to where uh, the last position that they were seen was and try and work out exactly where their tracks are. For those of you who are joining for the first time, this is a live safari, and that kind of explains why we were late. We were having a few audio issues on the stream out to you guys. Um, Another thing that's important to know is that my name is Scott, if it's your first safari. And thank you to some of our viewers who actually informed us that we were having audio problems. Now, on a live safari, we love to hear from you guys, your questions, your comments, your thoughts. So please send them through to us using the hashtag SafariLive on Twitter or sending an email through to questions at wildearth.tv. And that way we can converse and fine tune and tailor make this safari as best as possible to your needs. Obviously, because there are thousands of people watching at any given time, potentially, you must bear in mind that we cannot answer everybody's question, uh, but keep trying, and at some point, your questions will be answered. Um, Linda and many others, you guys have been missing the sunrise safaris. We had two mornings off, and I'm very happy to hear that you are enjoying being back out at dawn with us. And obviously, those tests that we did late at night causing us to sleep in on those two mornings are essential for the development of Wild Earth. And we've only got so many crew members, so we can only split our resources so far. But thank you for bearing with us, and it is actually great to be up and about early in the morning again. It was quite weird waking up not knowing what's gone on and heading out on the sunset safari with no idea what had occurred and unfolded here on Juma at night. And Nikki's just noticed a kind of pink tinge. And there is this kind of weird light being cast by these clouds and I guess the rising sun that's behind them. It was a little bit more noticeable earlier, just a few seconds ago, but I don't think you'd be able to pick it up. But there is this bizarre light being cast. It could be a combination of this kind of globe effect that the clouds are having diffusing the sun that's rising beyond them together with the very barren drought-stricken soils. I think the two of them combined are creating this kind of slightly pink tinge. The dual water is just ahead of us. And I can see a buffalo already from here, so I don't think the lion are anywhere nearby unless they're about to pounce on it. Wouldn't that be a great way to start the morning? Not for the buffalo, obviously, but for us. Now, what this means is the lions may have come and gone, or maybe they have not been here at all. There's the buffalo over there. And it looks like there's two of them over there. They've already got some ox peckers, the birds that glean the parasites off them. One was right on the center of the boss. The hippo in the water, you can see what looks to be a rock there. And rambling Tin Lizzie 
You've mentioned that the sky looks kind of crazy and wild this morning, and well done. I'm glad you also picked up on it, and it's not just our imagination here. And great to hear from you. I haven't heard your interesting name yet on these live safaris, so... Good to hear from you. And like I said, I know there's a lot of you out there who may have been watching for quite some time now, but have yet to get a hold of us. And you don't have to ask us questions. You can just tell us where you are, who you are, what you think, um, because it's always wonderful to hear some new names on what is no doubt the largest safari vehicle on the planet. Brian in Philadelphia, you may be watching, uh, he discovered a Safari Live in December 2014. And within six months, he had already booked his first safari, he came out and stayed here, and we went and met up with him and asked him, have you ever sent any questions? And he said, no, but he, had, he loves the, 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 the safari experience so much that he even come out here. But since then, Brian has been chatting with us, sending through the odd question, or just letting us know he's there. And like I said, it's not only about questions, but also just about knowing who is on the vehicle is also good fun. Good morning, Baba Bui. Let's see what's going on here, Brian. This will the beast look a little bit worked up here. What's going on, Wildebeets? Oh, you know what I think they may have seen? I think they may have seen the big balloon, Brian, if you pan a little bit to the left. Maybe not, maybe it's something else. We'll rush over there now, but it could be that big white balloon that's exciting them, who knows? That is the new experiment that our tech team is busy working on. Classified, top secret balloon. Only kidding, we're hoping that that's going to become a portable mast for us, holding our equipment that will beam the signal to, through from the vehicle up to that balloon, as opposed to building a big concrete and metal tower. The male's right in front. Let's catch up with him. He's going to... He's going to lead the charge towards any threats. What were you reading? He's looking further down this way. Come on, please be something. Oh, yes, we're in luck. There's something here. There has to be something here. Now the Impala are looking very intently in that direction. Could be a leopard, could be lion, could be cheetah, who knows? Maybe wild dog even. Yes, there must be something here. Come on. Impala are alarm calling, and it's the lions. Yay. You can hear the pff, pff, snorts of the Impala. And here come our ladies, the Incohuma Lioness. Fantastic. Good morning. There's another. And this is fantastic start to the morning. Brent, uh, the Inkohumas are on the northern edge of quarantine. Uh, okay, got me going Scottish for half past you on our way out. Now, I forgot to mention earlier that Jamie Patterson is also out with, I think, David on camera. And they were just having a few tech difficulties. I'm just going to keep rolling forward here, try and get right in front of these lines. I think they may be heading to the Gallego waterhole as opposed to the Juma waterhole for their drink. But anything's possible. And we are in for a treat. Just want to get onto this road so we're going to forego seeing them for a few seconds in order to get some great low angle shots of them walking straight towards us. Hey, Brian in Philadelphia, you are here with us. Wonderful. Okay, this is going to be good. We're going to have them coming straight towards us at a low angle. Good 
morning, Orbs. Um, you and Brent are more than welcome to join the crossing over via Tiller Access. I think they're going to head towards the Gallagher Water Hole. Now, this is interesting. I've, uh, I've just seen four. Um, I could only see three initially, but so far I've seen four. The fifth member is unaccounted for. Uh, no, it's also just popped in some of you. So all five of them are here. It's a pride of five lioness for those of you who are joining for the first time. Kachino, John, you were wondering earlier. Oh, we may see some playful action here. Here we go. Wonderful. Now, just a a couple of mornings ago, we had some incredible sightings of them playing around with one another. And we're just going to get one more, the last lady who's going to pop out into the road now. We've got Aubrey, who's just joined behind us. And what I'm going to do is maybe let him sneak ahead of us once this lady has moved past so that his guests can get a view. It's going to be tricky to follow them through this thick bush. Well, we're going to, like I said, let Aubrey head, head on in front of us. It's going to be a while since we, until we get some more good views of them. So um, we're going to send you across to Jamie to let her know. Uh, you guys know her plans. And as soon as we've got another view of the lions, we'll get back to you. Wonderful way to start off our somewhat gloomy sunrise safari than with the Mooma ladies wandering across quarantine. We were two seconds away from getting there before Scott. We just come out. Our camera had a, a minor nervous breakdown this morning, which is why we were out a little bit late. But we were watching the wildebeest and the impala alarm call and racing across in that direction. We just stopped to make sure everything was good to go. But brilliant nonetheless, the Nkuhumas making their way seemingly towards Galago Pan. Now the morning is filled with alarm calls. The monkeys, the vervet monkeys are going crazy at <coughs> sound that they make when there's either a leopard or a lion. Now the distance, they could probably see those lions. I guess they're alarm calling at the lions, but I'm just coming down to Juma Dam just to check up on that make sure that there's no sign that maybe they haven't seen a leopard that we're going to miss because we thought they were focused on the lions. I'm just checking carefully around the drainage line because there's another set of vervets calling over there. It could just be in response to everybody else. Morning Hippo. Morning Buffalo. Uh, even though it was a little bit drizzly last night, the lions are still not enough to fill up any of the, sort of the groundwater. I'm sure one cat was wondering, did we have any rain? And the answer is maybe a, dr a drip or two or a drizzle. You know that yesterday afternoon on the sunset safari, there was a bit of rain coming through. But it was, it really wasn't very much in terms of providing any kind of difference, but at least for the plants, that little bit, every little extra bit of moisture counts, even for these buffalo. But still, not enough to fill any groundwater, which is why we think that those lionesses are probably on their way to Galago Pan. Up in the tree. Yeah, I think it's the Warburgs. Looks like it might be. Fairly certain it's the Warburgs, but let's reposition. Go and have a look. Oh. I think they might even be feeling a little bit frisky. Let's go and investigate. Sorry, Buffalo. It's okay, I'm moving out the side, you don't know, up. It's all good. Go. Let's go figure out what those birds of prey are up to. It's okay, Buff. Definitely the Warburg pair. There we 
go. Warburg's pair. And in this sort of situation where they're sitting right close to each other, you can really see the size difference between the male and the female. The male is at the back, sort of to the left-ish, and the female is closer towards us on the branch that's sort of curving out to the right. And all birds of prey, as our regular viewers know, the female is larger than the male. And there's lots of evolutionary theories about why that might be the case. And they provide for some very interesting thinking, if not necessarily automatic explanations. One idea is that the maternal instinct is strong enough to keep the chick safe, but the paternal instinct is slightly less powerful, and being birds of prey, that would often target little bird species or anything like that. There's always the chance that the instinct or the hunting instinct of the father might be triggered by the movements and the squeaking of the chicks. And so the female has to be a little bit larger and bulkier in order to be able to protect her youngsters and keep them from doing any kind of damage. An interesting theory. It's up to you whether or not you believe it. In the meantime, though, the lions are going on a walk and apparently walking quite close to where a buffalo is. So let's find out how that plays out. Okay, everyone. As you can see, we've got some Cape buffalo in front of us. And there's a few more beyond these two that we can see in the thick bush. I'm battling to tell what the wind is doing, but there's a strong chance that these lion may smell the buffalo or hear them and that way change their direction of movement from the waterhole to the buffalo. So we're just standing by here very patiently in the hope that we may see some lion-buffalo interaction. But I've got a feeling that the lions are gonna head past them to the waterhole, but I'd rather take the risk of sitting here while the lions have a sip of water, which is something we see them doing fairly regularly whereas seeing them chasing buffalo is less common. So it's a gamble. The wind is blowing towards us. I can just feel it now. I mean, it's swirling ever so slightly, which means that the wind is not in the favor of the lions. They will not smell these buffalo. Copy, thanks, Sprint. We've just been standing by with some Nyari um, on the way there, but thank you. Okay, well, Brent's just confirmed that the lion are at the waterhole, as we expected them to be, but always worth making sure we don't miss out on any action. Hello to Natasha in Ontario, who has been watching, I think for the last two weeks, every single sunrise safari. And you interested to know uh, how many prides of lion do we see here? And this is the main pride that we see, the Inkahoma pride. Things have changed for them since I started here in the, at the end of 20, uh, 2014, sorry. Um, and they had three pride members killed and uh, one young male's moved off. Um, in the time that I've been here, so they're down to five now. They haven't had any cubs since I've been here. Then other prides that we can see are the Styx pride. It's kind of three groups of two females, but they're all part of the same original pride. They had the only cubs that we've seen in the year that I've been here, just over the year that I've been here, but they sadly have also been killed. And the Inkohoma lioness and the Styx cubs were all killed by the same marauding males, the Birmingham coalition, which is now the dominant coalition which reigns over Juma and surroundings. We haven't seen them for quite some time, but I'm sure they're going to pop back for a visit soon. So we've got the Styx pride of lioness, the Inkohoma pride of lioness. We occasionally see the Salala pride, Salala breakaway pride, but again, very seldomly. Uh, and then the main uh, coalition of males who services all these prides of females is the Birmingham males. The old coalition was the Timber males. So that's basically it to the north. We've got the Talamati pride that we don't really see. There's also Torchwood pride. So there's several prides uh, surrounding us. But for now, this is the pride that we spend more time with than any other.
blackmail that we've just been speaking of and whether or not he has been in a fight. And yes, I have heard the stories of him being in a fight. Isn't this awesome with all four of them lined up perfectly? The fifth and final one didn't sort of play along because that would have been great if they were all right next to one another. But yes, Derek, I did hear about that fight. It was the Machapiri males, I'm told, that got a hold of him. And he's got a couple of wounds. He's also looking a little bit thin. But they are getting towards the end of their reign. Those Matimba males, they're old boys now. Isn't this great? All different shapes and sizes. And they're probably aging from, or ranging from about four years of age to about eight years of age. One of which has got bright amber eyes. Um, so look out for her. She is called Amber Eyes, funnily enough. So she's the easiest to distinguish. And she's the one that's standing up at the moment. The one on the far left is the oldest lioness in the pride. She's got a broken bottom canine that we may just be able to get a glimpse of as she laps up this water. This is in all likelihood the first time they've drunk, and it certainly looks like it since they fed on that zebra last night. And just like I'm taking some photographs, I would suggest you guys also get involved and take some screenshots. What I'm going to do is I'm going to just keep quiet for a moment, and there's a strong chance you may even be able to hear them lapping up the water. You may just be able to faintly hear them lapping up the water. Mike Costin is watching on YouTube. You would like to know what would happen if there was a tiny, uh, sorry, a crocodile in this tiny little pond. And would these lion be in trouble? And um, yes, most certainly. Uh, crocodiles get massive. You get 20-foot crocodiles in some parts of Africa, and they can quite easily snack on a lion. Um, even though we typically don't get big monster crocodiles anywhere on Juma, not that I've seen in over the year that I've been here, anything can happen. And I know of a story not too far south of us in the Sabi Sands of a big male lion quenching his thirst at a waterhole. And everyone got the frights of their lives when a ginormous crocodile lurched out and grabbed that big male lion by the head and pulled it under the water, and that was that. So. It has happened even to the biggest of male lions. And lions will be very cautious of crocodiles. Sometimes when lions need to swim out to carcasses, well, they don't need to. They take the risk of swimming out like a dead hippo, for example. There's a chance that a crocodile may snack on them, so it won't be the first lion that's been killed by one, and they will be cautious of them. It's quite funny sometimes you'll see lions going up to the water's edge and just hissing at the water in the knowing that there could be a crocodile nearby. And just two more that you can hear lapping away now. I'm guessing what could well happen. Oh, has that one lady got a little bit of a limp? Maybe she picked up an injury when she was hunting the zebra last night. Or who knows, maybe it's just a thorn that's in the pad of her foot. Now, even though those buffalo are not too far away, and even though the wind is not in the lion's favor to smell them, maybe through default, the lion are gonna head off in that way. 
they are looking in that direction. And because their senses are so much better than ours, it's hard to tell exactly what they're hearing or smelling. But maybe, just maybe, we're going to see some action unfold a bit later. Those big Cape Buffalo bulls are not going to be an easy meal for the lioness. And the fact that they are fairly satisfied with regard to their hunger after feeding on a zebra fall last night, they may not be inclined to take any chances, but only time will tell. And that one lioness, you can see, is really focused in on that area. She's the one that's actually heading off there now. Please keep going. Oh, she knows about something in there. She definitely does. I'm confident about that. Well, Lauren Pretorius, thank you so much for letting us know that all the way in South Dakota you could even hear those lions drinking, and those are the updates we love. Now, I'm not going to waste any time, and I want to get into the right position in case these lions do go after the buffalo, and they're heading straight towards them. What I want to do is get onto the other side of the buffalo so that we can see the action as the buffalo run past us, possibly, or, or and use this virtual reality rig, which is a 360-degree camera, um, which will get some great footage of these buffalo if they do in fact come charging past us. Now, oh, I'm not convinced the lions are going to go this way, but I'd rather leave Aubrey and Brent, who's driving around some guests, a friend of his who's up from America, and their friends. And I'll leave them with the lion to see where they go. I don't think these lions are heading in the right direction, sadly. I was wishfully hoping that that was going to be the case. Just to give you an idea of exactly where the buffalo are in relation to the pan, let me continue until we get a view of them. But the wind was blowing from the pan towards the buffalo, which means the lions are not going to be able to smell them. And it's just a little bit too far. Somewhere just over here. I can't see any sign of them now, so maybe they've caught wind of the lion and already moved off. Now, I know yesterday was quite a tricky sighting emotionally because that poor zebra foal was not killed very effectively by the lioness and was alive for quite some time as they tore it apart. And Carol, you would like to know why is it, why do I think the lions didn't kill it um, and suffocate it as they normally would? Probably because they felt there was no need to. They had pulled it down and with a lot of smaller prey, um, you'll often find uh, that prides or, or predators will start tearing them apart um, before they actually kill them because there's no need to kill them because they're confident that they're not going to escape. Whereas a Cape Buffalo, until it is dead, it can get up and run off. The lioness are just moving past us here, so my precautionary measures to make sure we're in the right place for action have not paid off. But I think it was definitely worth the investigation. Go ahead, Brent. Continuing north. Affirmative, Brent. I went back to those buffalo uh, that Aubrey and I saw um, just to make sure that the lions weren't heading towards them, but they, they're not. They've crossed straight towards the hyena den. Okay, copy that. Thank you. Okay, so now we're going to need a loop ahead. They're going into quite a tricky area here.
Okay, so let's try Gulupa Hero and get you some frontal views. And while we do that, we are all going to be sending you back to Jamie Patterson. And we'll see you guys shortly. While Scott tries to catch up with those lionesses, I've had a sudden thought about their direction that they're going in, which is straight towards the hyena den. Now, I know that Scott said that he's going to loop around to try and get in front of them. I'm not sure if that means he's going to go to the hyena den or not. If not, I think I might pop my nose in and make sure that the hyenas are all present and accounted for and safe. Let's find out what's happening there. In fact, I think that's my plan. That's what I'm going to be doing. On this kind of day and this kind of life, it's amazing how most of the animals all of a sudden become late sleepers, apart from, of course, those lionesses who are on the move. The rest of the animals of Juba don't seem to want to come out to play. They will be hiding in the bush, waiting for it to get a little bit warmer, for the sun to come out. I think that they, I, I assume that they, as, as well as us, would be rejoicing in the steady drop in temperature that we've experienced over the last few days. Oh, as Scott loops around, let's have a quick look at what he's seeing of those lions. Welcome back, everyone. And we just managed to get ahead of the Inkahuma pride of lion. And it's deja vu, as Brian says. We saw them moving in this exact area just a couple of days back after those buffalo chased them, and they chased the buffalo. It was one of the most exciting mornings I've spent with this pride of lion as they were as playful as they've ever been for me. You can see this one, it's interesting. She urinates almost purposefully on the, her heels, on her back feet, and then rubs her feet in it. And that's to leave a trail of her scent as she walks around. But it wasn't a very clear scent mark. It's, it's hard to sometimes distinguish the difference between a line scent marking and merely urinating. Oh, I was hoping they were going to continue streaming straight past us, but as you can see, this is obviously a patch of Juma that they like to reside and relax during the day where they can groom themselves and simply relax and wait for the next cover of darkness before they move again, which is, I'm guessing, going to be the case. It's impossible to be certain. Yesterday, we were very pleasantly surprised by the fact that they were on the move very early on in the afternoon, and that cool weather that we were experiencing yesterday as well as today certainly helped that. But it wasn't only that, it was that coupled with the fact that they were hungry, I think, that got them moving. Okay, I think I'm gonna need to reverse a bit. My plans to get some views of them walking past us is not worked out well. Hello, Vincent, in Ohio, who's just 18 years old and has fairly recently discovered these live safaris and is loving them. So, Vincent, thank you very much for your kind words and always happy to have some new safari goers with us. But I'm even happier to hear that you are interested on how to become a safari guide. And, Vince, it is not difficult at all. Trust me. Um, if Brent and myself can do it, anyone can do it. Jamie and James, I think, are a little bit more intellectual than the two of us. But it's not difficult, and there's, a th I'm told, 30 different training companies that will facilitate your training, get you up to speed. And then there are many, many camps in the Sabi Sands, the reserve we work in, and throughout South Africa and Africa. So there are many, many different lodges where you'll be able to find work. 
And if it's something you're interested in, like I say, you're going to need to just come out to Africa and do the training course, which will take anywhere from six months to a year, so it's not a long training course. And thereafter, you start driving around guests and becoming more and more experienced each and every drive you take. So if you just search on the internet for any training facilities, you will come up with a whole host, and I'm sure via different reviews, you'll be able to work out which one is the best for your needs. Great, well, as these lions gently groom themselves, we are gonna send you for a quick change of scenery across with Jamie and a herd of wildebeest. Seems as though the presence of the Inkahumas on quarantine has prompted a mass migration of Juma, or at least Juma's almost entirety of their wildebeest population, the herd that Scott was originally watching on quarantine, now moving with a very, in a very determined fashion away from the lions. Interesting, interestingly, though, their chosen route could actually put them straight back in the lion's path. They're wandering north up Gauri Cut Line. It sounds as though the lions are planning on going north as well eventually. I did try and do a quick head count, or in this case, bottom count, of how many babies there are left in this herd. They've done exceptionally well, considering. One, two, three, four, five. I think I've counted nine earlier. I can try and reposition to get you a better view, but I think I counted nine. And one straggler that's coming in. Uh, no, they're all dashing off to meet him instead. There you go. The great migration of Juma. And I think also possibly dashing away because they've heard the lions and they've spooked some of the other wildebeest and zebra, and it's, it's absolute chaos. I'm gonna go and find out exactly what's happening there, and while I do, let's find out what those lions are up to. So, the great migration of Juma. And interesting stuff, and I'm glad Jamie did race you across onto a vehicle to show you that. I'm even surprised by the fact that those wildebeest decided to run off that far to get away from these lion. They're not the, the sharpest of animals, wildebeest, because they could just be running into the next pride of lion wherever they're going. So it's sometimes better to keep an eye on your predators, like they were doing initially, I guess. Here we go, Brian, there appears to be another lioness that may be on her way into the action here. Who's she gonna decide to go and flop herself down onto? It looks like the middle of these two. The grooming chain continues. Now it's a three-way chain. <laughs> Isn't this awesome? And again, it, it always fascinates me how gentle and caring these animals can be, considering they were tearing apart a zebra foal last night. It's dirty business, hunting and catching prey. Now it's time that they spend some time grooming themselves and making sure that all their equipment is sound and ready for their next hunt, which could happen at any stage. And even though they are full belly now, even though they are lying down, if those buffalo stumble upon them or any other potential prey, they're not gonna forego an opportunity. And it's quite common to leave lion during the morning or at the morning on the morning safari. And then you come out back to the camp, enjoy breakfast and lunch, head out for the sunset safari, only to find that 
the lion have not moved a muscle but managed to make a kill exactly where they were lying. And that would have meant, obviously, that they haven't moved a muscle, but their prey has stumbled upon them, and they've capitalized on that easy meal. Hello to Deborah, the armchair traveler, who has only now realized that these lions have got a very distinctive black stripe on their ears. And I guess that is the joy about following these safaris. You've been with us for quite some time, yet it's the first time you've really focused on those ears. So obviously other parts of their anatomy have been captivating you. And who knows exactly what that's for? I mean, there's different theories. It's the same as their black blob on their tail. It could be a kind of follow me signal for cubs who will be following behind the adults. But that doesn't make huge sense to me, to be honest. Maybe it's just merely the way they've evolved and we cannot perfectly explain why, or at least I can't. Brian, if you don't mind, uh, just going on to this line on the left, her uh, back right foot has got a little wound on it. And I noticed it the other day, but it'll just be nice for everyone to take a close look at it. Now, it's nothing serious. But just to monitor how quickly she recovers from that little gash will be useful for us to know. They are such resilient animals that there is no, absolutely no concern that I have for that injury, but merely for interest sake, it'll be nice to keep an eye on that. Uh, interesting stuff, there's an update on the wildebeest migration, so why don't you head over to Jamie to see what they're up to. This is truly one of the most bizarre wildebeest sightings I've had in a while. Uh, they're crossing into Biffle's Hook. And I only just, just managed to catch up with them. And it was like following wild dogs, except faster, to try and loop around them. A whole herd walking into Biffle's Hook. And I try to get a count of the calf. It's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Still nine. No, there's ten. I see ten. Amazing. This herd has managed to keep them safe. Have a quick look for Kim in Michigan. As these females stop and turn and look at us, you'll be able to... Kim would like to know how you tell the difference between males and females. Look at the belly and the nipples between the back legs. So in a male wildebeest, you'll be able to see the penis sheet at that point where the belly curves and sort of changes direction. And then Kim also, male wildebeest, and unfortunately not being very obliging, I would very much like it if they would stop and turn and look at us. Male wildebeest have slightly more black on their face. Very often females have a brown strip on their forehead. Here goes the wildebeest migration, the great migration of 2016, all onto Biffle's Hook, which I fear is, is a considerably ill-considered choice on behalf of the wildebeest. That's where most of the big dams are. There's the huge Telemati pride. Sure. That's not where you want to go, wildebeest. Rather take your chances with the Nkuhunas. Oh, they're on their way. Maybe this is why they've done so well in keeping the youngsters all alive. I'm pretty sure I counted 10. Off they go. Hmm. Racing off, obviously I can't follow them across into Buffalo. But as I said, 
to try and get in front of them was a seriously impressive sort of bout of speed required and I had to have my foot pretty much flat. It goes to show, I mean, that is what wildebeest are designed and structured for. Those big powerful shoulders and sloping backs automatically give you an idea that that animal is built for stamina and speed, just like hyenas are structured in exactly the same way. But speaking of Ferrari safaris, Charlotte was wondering, would we ever have a Ferrari safari on a night drive through the bush? The answer is no, Charlotte, not to the same extent. Um, you just can't to the same degree watch for obstacles ahead of you. Obviously, we don't want to either interfere with the animals, which is particularly possible at night because you can't necessarily see where they all are. And also the fact that we would probably do serious damage to the cars. Already these vehicles work very hard, twice a day, every day. And on wild dog sightings in particular, or in wild dog sightings in particular, they work very, very hard to try and keep pace with the pack and actually try and give you an impression of just how fluidly and smoothly a wild dog movement of the entire pack actually plays out. At night, no way. There's no way that we could do it. I think that there's a few of us who might give it more of a good try than others. I personally get very uncomfortable trying to race through the bush at night. You never know when a hole might decide to come and surprise you, quite possibly break a steering arm or a column or a stump. You might put yourself up on that. So no, no Ferrari safaris at night, but our wildebeest have Ferrari safari into Buffelshook. It remains to be seen if that was their most sensible decision. I'm going to carry on with my original plan before I got distracted of making my way towards the hyena then. In the meantime, let's find out what those lionesses are up to. So, the wildebeest are now safely far, far away from these sleepy lions. And two of them have got up and moved ever so slightly, but Amber Eyes is still nearby. This is the one we're looking at now. A Cape Turtle Dove calling behind us. It's only laying out a, a portion of its call at the moment. Interesting question through from Larry. You would like to know my thoughts on whether these lions may have made another kill after that small zebra last night. I don't think so. Judging by their bellies, it looks like they've all had their fair share of a zebra fall. Um, but maybe I'm wrong. Maybe they did manage to catch something small like an impala that they shared amongst themselves. But I do not think that is the case. I guess James would be the right person to ask, though, because he was with them right at the end of the sunset safari, and he would have seen their full bellies, or a lot of you, actually, were also there. Um, whereas I was not, and I have not looked at any of the highlights of how they looked at the end of that, but from my experience, it looks like they have just fit on that zebra fall and nothing else. I always find it interesting how lions will kind of chop and change and shift about. They're probably going to spend the entire day here, but it takes them a while to find the spot that they are most comfortable in. And that individual is doing just that at the moment. Marianne in Arkansas, you've just come up with a little saying, a great sky in the morning, sailors take warning, bad weather is coming. I hope you are right, Marianne. We need as... We need as much bad weather as possible. By bad weather, it's quite interesting how humans refer to rain as, as bad weather. But without rain, we would die. So it's actually great weather. <laughs> um, just an interesting way of thinking about things, I guess. 
Without rain, there will not be life, as we can kind of see in this barren earth that old Amber Eyes is lying on now. She would usually have a nice, comfortable, grassy cushion to receive her body, but not at the moment. Oh, look at that. Straight ahead of us there, Brian. A hyena running off back to the den sites. And I don't think the lions even had a clue that it was there. No, one of them picked its head up. And that young hyena is very, very lucky that it did not run slap bang into these lions because then, like that baby zebra, it too would have been shredded to pieces. But you'll find that it wasn't through default that the hyena avoided these lions, and they have got such good senses, such a strong sense of smell, that it could probably avoid the lion merely by using its nose. James is also out on tracking team this morning, so even though he's got the morning off, he's decided to come out and give Jamie and I a hand, which is very kind of him. So he is searching the property. He's just come across a young elephant bull, which is great news, because there haven't been too many elephants around at the moment, not as many as we've been seeing a couple of weeks ago. But that's normal. The elephants come and go, as do the zebra. So we're going to send you across to Jamie, who's just found some. I Zebra, zebra going, zebra almost okay, gone. Okay. I think we might have just caught the tail end of them, quite literally, as they are also wandering onto Buffle's hook. Obviously not keen to stick around when the Inkahumas are about, although one can hardly blame them after the events of yesterday. This isn't the same herd, by the way. I'd be very surprised. Look at that. How did you catch the tail end of that zebra? That is definitely the tail end of that zebra. The wall beast is absolutely correct. And as usual, it is a male zebra missing a tail. Both females and males often uh, lack a tail. And inevitably, that is caused Probably by not, uh, other zebras uh, biting each other. It's actually two stallions moving together. So a bachelor herd. That thin stripe between the bottom is indicative. It can be very tricky to tell the difference between male and female zebra even more so than it is with the wildebeest that we were talking about earlier. So, a bachelor group of two. And that one that we're looking at could well be responsible for the missing tail of the injured zebra. Interesting. Great, my great migration going across. Stacy Crouch, when I said that it was kind of sad that the migration was, or Stacy Crouch has said it's kind of sad that the migration is going on during this drought. I am sort of exaggerating. I'm kind of joking in the fact that it's just, because I'm on the boundary, the Buffles Hook boundary, it seems as though most of the animals are going there. The wildebeest, particularly, not due to the drought, but just because of the, the fact that the lions were in the area and they're moving their youngsters off to safety, which of course, wasn't the case with that poor little zebra foal yesterday. So maybe a more sensible decision on their part. I can almost guarantee they will be back. There's no part really that is better for them than others. It's just that maybe Buffles Hook has a little bit more in the way of big dams and big waters, but at the same time, that inevitably means that there's a pride of lions around somewhere. We've seen it with the Nkuhumas. They've decided, it seems, to spend a lot of their time between One-Eyed Pan and Galago Pan. So we're seeing them regularly, which is awesome for us. Yeah, a little bit less so for the general game species that have to go and visit those water sources, so they have to be in the area. But when I said it was a great migration, we don't get any huge migrations of the bigger mammal species. We might get migrations of, for example, birds or bat species, but not so much with the large mammals in the way that you would in Eastern Africa, so Tanzania and Kenya, the Maasai area. We don't have those huge migration patterns. Right. I will eventually try and get to the hyena den. It just seems as though the animals keep distracting me by wandering across my path. In the meantime, let's see if those lions have decided to wander or if they're still in the same place. So Amber Eyes has got up and positioned herself directly in front of us with the other lioness. And it appears that these ladies are going to be spending the rest of the day here. Maybe we're wrong. 
but I don't think we are going to stick around to find out. James has just heard some kudu alarm calling around Bufflesook Waterhole, and that sounds a lot more exciting than si sitting here. So we might head over there to give him a hand and see what else is happening here on Juma. Let me just reposition and get you one last view of the other lions. We're just off to our left over here. Well, it looks like we probably won't need to. It looks like one of them at least is coming out into this little clearing. The other tricky thing about this area is just about anywhere they go from here is going to be very difficult to follow them through. So even if they were to get active, it's not going to be feasible for us to stay with them. But trust me, if I had any inclination that they were going to move, I would stick around. interested to know whether I think the lions licking and grooming one another. Hold on a second. Just listening to Brent and James. was telling his guests not to grab a branch there. That's hilarious. You just heard him saying, don't grab it, don't grab it. <laughs> oh, the joys of having guests on the back of your vehicle as opposed to what we have to deal with with you guys scattered around the globe is two very different scenarios. <laughs> and I'm sure Brent has forgotten a lot of the realities of having guests on the vehicle that he is now being pleasantly reminded of. <laughs> that was awesome. But basically, they were talking about something running away from something else. But I think it's basically just buffalo tracks that are thundering in a westerly direction. There's no evidence of any lion tracks after them. But just... Yeah, I know when he's going to win. I'm going to go Anyway, we're going to turn that radio down because it seems like it's not providing us with any interesting info. So, Bill, sorry, back to your question. I didn't finish your answer to your question. You would like to know whether I thought the lions will um, groom one another because there's that smell of blood still on their coats or whether it's merely a bonding ritual. And I don't think it's because there's blood on the coats. I think it's just to affirm the strong bonds or reaffirm the strong bonds between these social cats. So whether there's blood on their coats or not, so they will still groom one another and try and glean the parasites off one another using their teeth. No blood required, Bill. Yeah, there's a hyena whooping. Sounds quite far away. You'll never be able to hear it. We can only just faintly pick it up. Now, before we head off, we're just going to show you one last interesting thing about these lines. And I think it's the one in the middle might be your best bet there, Brian, to show the size of the back foot in relation to the front foot. And right there, you can see clearly that the back feet are not nearly 
as big, slightly more narrow as well than the front foot. And that's common of all four-legged animals, the front foot being the biggest and the back foot being the smallest. Great. Well, we're going to head off. I'm not too sure where yet. There's quite a few people driving around on Juma, so maybe I'm going to leave Jamie and James here to do that, and maybe we'll head across to Arethusa. Again, I've been trying to increase our likelihood of seeing the Anderson male leopard, and in order to see that, we will need to head across there. And before we head off, we'll just answer one more question from Boyd in North Carolina. And you would like to know... Uh, interesting stuff. Brent's just found a male leopard. And Jamie is kind of in that area, so she's going to race along there, but the leopard doesn't look relaxed, so it's an unknown male leopard. Possibly the same individual whose tracks I had on, had on Buffalo's hook cut line just a few days back, and I said, this is strange. We haven't seen Tingana this far north. Maybe it's another male. And Brent's just found him, so well done to Brent. And let's hope that the leopard does not remain to be too skittish and that Jamie does manage to get you guys a glimpse of that. So that's some very exciting prospects, and obviously the fact that James is out has helped everyone to find that leopard because... It was James who heard the kudu alarm calling in that general area. So well done to James and Brent for a team effort on finding that. And that's some exciting prospects. Sorry, back to the question, though. Um, do predators feed on other predators when they kill them? Even though the textbooks used to suggest that they don't, they will. So yes, lion will feed on other lion that they've killed. I've seen leopard feed on their own cubs that have been killed by male leopards. Strange things do happen, but predators will feed on other predators, bottom line. Good stuff. <coughs> we are going to be sending you across to Jamie and some kudu. I'm not sure if they are the same kudu which were alarm calling at that leopard, but either way, off you go. Now, we haven't quite got to the kudu that were alarming at the leopard. I'm sure that Scott's already updated you about the fact that Brent has seen that leopard. The reason that I'm not racing off is it seems as though it is that skittish male around Buffles Hook Dam. So what I'm doing is I'm giving it a chance, and I wonder if you guys have spotted what I've spotted yet. But I'm giving it a chance, or Brent a chance at least, to follow up and establish that sighting. Because too many vehicles moving around a leopard that is not relaxed is not going to be of any use. Have you guys spotted the baby kudu yet? I wonder how many of you have. Here we go. Oh, here we go. And that is a very, very brand new baby. It's still a little bit damp. I can see its umbilical cord hanging down. And Brent's just trying to call me. Sorry, guys. Hold on a sec. Look at the mom licking it. That is such a fresh baby. Standing by. Oh. Jamie, what's your position? Welcome to the world, little one. Buffalo's Hook Cut Line, Junction Hyena Road. Copy, come towards um, Quarry Pine Road. Uh, oh, okay. Hook Copy that, I'll make my way there now. How cute is that? Have you got visual? I'm standing by the dam. So tiny. That is I'm such a I'm brand visual. new um, baby kudu. Just lost visual now. I might pop out at the dam. I'm hoping that the mom keeps it well away from this male leopard that's wandering through. I'm going to leave her for now. I'm going to leave her in peace, especially because that baby is so new and there's a leopard around the area. Leave her to keep her senses on high alert and to look after it. Also, the fact that it's in Buffalo's Hook itself, so our visual isn't fantastic. But that is a nice surprise for the morning. Brand new, brand, brand new baby for you. Hey, little one. Good luck, baby. Yeah, okay. One last. Sorry, I'm busy looking at it because I want to see if I can find you one last view. Go backwards a little bit. I'm going to move off with mom. 
It's okay, baby. You can follow. Look how wobbly it looks. Okay, right? Damp and new doesn't to the world. Well, no, no, uh, doesn't look too bad now. Um, I think he was. You feel it swaying. Something else rather than us. Sniffing the air after mom and delicately picking its way after her. <laughs> On very unsteady legs. Antelope always astound me the speed at which. Whoop. Wobble. Uh, we've lost a good view. It's time for us to go and follow up on that leopard before Earth decides to cross. I just need to listen to the Game Drive channel for a second. Okay, we're going to do a, a slight Ferrari safari, but I'm also giving them a chance to follow up. Brent says that he doesn't think that leopard was spooked by the vehicles, but rather by something else. was that? A little baby kudu sighting to start the morning. In terms of which male leopard it is, and I'm sort of competing with the wind, shouting into the microphone a bit, Paul Rizzo was wondering, is it not perhaps Anderson? Anything is possible, Paul. Um, it's unlikely though. It's completely to the eastern boundary, whereas Anderson's territory generally tends to be elephant plains and around the western boundary of Arethusa, so essentially almost completely in the opposite direction. Alternatively, there's three other leopards that could be apart from Anderson in this area. One is Mpula, the other is Tingana, who's pushed essentially into Mpula's territory all the way towards Torchwood. And there's one other male. He's been nicknamed Gijima by the Buffalo's Hook landowners. They've seen him once or twice. He was seen mating with Karula when I very first started working here many months ago. And he is not a relaxed leopard. It means that he's come in from outside. He's quite a big leopard. He's coming to establish a territory. He hasn't been seen in months, but he is quite a large leopard, but clearly not a Sabi Sands leopard because he clearly hasn't been raised with vehicles moving around in the area in the same way our other leopards have. And that's why I'm approaching with a degree of caution in this case, because we don't want to spook him any further. So it might be that we need to just give him a little bit or quite a bit more personal space than we might be able to give our other leopards. A little bit about. Uh, oh, sorry, hold on a second. Uh, he's, not, he's not come forward, Morgan. Um, he's headed into the drainage line between the Hyena Road and. Sorry, Corey everyone. Bear. Sorry, Morgan. Access for relocation now. will be on Hyena Road, quite close to that big golf zone next to the road. Copy that, thanks, Brent. I'll try and pull it up there. Right, so the news from Brent, he did manage to relocate that leopard, but the leopard is, is definitely Gajima, or the, le the leopard nicknamed Gajima, it's not an official name, and he clearly isn't relaxed around vehicles. Interesting that he's decided to wander in to this particular part of the territory. Maybe he feels that with Tingana pushing Bula away, there's an opportunity for him to steal his own little chunk of Juma and establish it as his own. Now the question comes to comes down to if we will be able to relax a leopard like this, and it, it's a very, very gradual process if he do, does decide to move in, and getting him accustomed to the presence of vehicles, staying very, very far away, looking, observing constantly what his body language is doing, and whether or not he's displaying any signs of discomfort, and then sitting and waiting, and just getting him used to the vehicle, without putting him under any kind of pressure. What we're going to try and do is we're going to try and loop around towards Hyena Road, which I have just gone past. Very interesting. Now, I got completely distracted by the game drive comms. 
and I'm going to actually stop the car to answer Mark's question. I'm not going to race off because already this leopard is skittish, so I'm going to give it some time to relax and start wandering through. And in fact, you never know. He might have been trying to head towards Buffalo Cab. He might actually, once the other vehicles have left the area, decide to come and join us. So I'm going to just sit here for a moment at Buffalo Cab. And in the meantime, I'm going to answer Mark's question as best I can. So we spoke about Karula, the queen of Juma, and we know that she had a brand newborn cubs a couple of weeks, cubs, or one, at least one cub, maybe two or more, a couple of weeks ago. Now Mark wants to know, do we have any updates on Karula and her cubs? The answer, Mark, is no. And I will explain, to, look, anything is possible. It is the bush. We don't necessarily get to see every aspect of the secrets that she holds. Now, in all of our combined years experience, to us, Karula is not behaving in a way that a leopard with cubs should behave. That is not to say that she's lost them absolutely 100% for sure. We are starting to believe that there is a chance that she has though. So quite a sad situation, but it's unconfirmed. So none of us are giving you a definitive answer. It's just that her behavior doesn't seem to indicate movement to and from a den site. And with limited water in a drought situation like this, we should be seeing that relatively clearly. Now, with all of the tracks that come through, that we haven't seen her. She's moving in a very scattered, imprecise way, which leopards do naturally. But usually leopards with cubs tend to have a bit more of a focused attention around a certain area. If she does have cubs, if those cubs are still alive, they're probably around Gallego area somewhere, probably between Mvuba Road and Gauri Cut Line. Now, as soon as we know anything more, uh, we'll let you know. Otherwise, it's just going to be a matter of waiting to see whether or not she does actually have cubs that come out. From what we've seen with her as well, when we have had sightings with her, although her nipples are engorged, which is natural when a leopard has had cubs, there's no clear signs of suckle marks. That might mean that in the heat it's dried up and that she hasn't been feeding them at the time or it might mean that she's lost her cubs. At this point, we just don't know. We're just letting you know that to us and all of our experience, we're bringing you the truest reflection of our interpretation of the situation. Right. There's Brent, guiding out of Vuyatella. Give him a big wave. He's completely ignoring us. <laughs> so Brent's updating Scott on which leopard it was. Sorry, I just want to listen to this update. Just give me one second. So Brent's saying that this leopard that he saw was a similar size to Tingana, but very, very skittish, and he actually jogged away from them. I'm going to try one loop onto Hyena Road to see if he pops out there. I'm going to just stand by there, sit quietly, and in the hope that he decides to wander through. Generally, leopards like this that are not relaxed are much more skittish during the day than they are at night, and I think that Scott and Nikki might have seen him once before wander past the car on one of the night drives that we occasionally do. But we'll have to wait and see. It'll just be one of those open-ended questions. In the meantime, let's find out what Scott has been up to since you've been with us, and I will catch up with you very soon. Well, some exciting stuff here on Juma, an unknown leopard, and let's hope Jamie manages to get you a glimpse of it. Like she says, it is possibly the same male Nikki and I have seen later on a night drive, who I think the buffles are uh, kind of people who spend more time in his general area, or in a specific leopard's general area, call him Gijima, which means to run in Zulu and obviously it's because he runs away from the vehicles and it's not uncommon for leopard to behave like that i'm so sad actually that you guys didn't get to see a glimpse of how a regular leopard works we call them skittish leopards but to be honest that's normal um, it's, it's it's regular for a leopard to be very shy and elusive and scared of vehicles and most wilderness destinations you go to that is the kind of view you'll get of them a fleeting glimpse Whereas here in the Saabi Sands, we are incredibly, incredibly spoiled with the level to which the leopards have been habituated. Anyway, I did get a hold of Brent on the radio. He said it's a big male, possibly the size of Tingana. Um, and that's all the info I have for you. As you can see, we have made our way to the hyena den. There's one adult up there. 
and it looks like there may be a youngster running straight up past it. Oh, it got a big fright, so I'm not too sure what from exactly. Maybe it had just ventured a little bit too far from the burrow. And it wasn't that cute. They are, like most young animals, adorable, but I have a particular soft spot for these little fur balls. I'm not sure who's who here, whether this is uh, December or November. I'm guessing this could be possibly the December youngsters. Oh. And possibly that's November over there. But hard to tell who's who this. They're growing up so quickly. And December 1, you can distinguish by the little white patch on its one foot. But I think it's the two Decembers, the slightly smaller ones, understandably, because they were born in December, and then November possibly to the right of them, ever so slightly larger. And hard to believe that just a few months ago they were pitch black. And within a few months they're already beginning to take on the appearance of an adult spotted or laughing hyena. Hugely complex social structures these animals have. And we can see a little bit, bit of that unfolding right now. Whew, I mean, that was seriously aggressive for an animal so young, but this aggression does need to be displayed from a young age and hierarchies are maintained and established from, from the get-go. Not uncommon for hyenas to be so aggressive that they may outcompete and even kill their siblings or any other rival competition. Well done, Brian. He's read into their behavior and saw their head pop up and look off and that's what caused Brian to get you in on the action here, another adult returning. Isn't it interesting how the older they become, the shorter their hair becomes and also the less prominent their spots become. Oh, well, this looks like the proud mother of, I think, the Decembers. Ephraim, Ephraim. And they are excited to start nursing on her. Hi. Oh, no, I'm told that I'm told that this could be pretty, actually. Mother of November, not December. What I can tell you is that the smell that's permeating from this den is getting quite tangy. Um, a wet, blankety dog smell, I guess. A wet dog blanket smell is probably a better way of describing it. Which led Brian and I to the discussion, and that's probably a, com a, a big reason why it does smell here. Yeah, that's a patch of urine, and adults hyena will enjoy urinating in set spots, often right at the entrances to their cubs' dens or cubs' burrows, and that will be to obviously leave a uh, clear message for any other adult hyena moving into that area that there's a certain story or message left behind in that urine, no doubt. But as I was saying, it's led Brian and I to the discussion that possibly these animals are going to think about moving den sites at some point because they will move dens every couple of months. There's no set rule. And one of the thought processes behind that is because it starts getting really dirty, full of parasites, full of excrements, and if you move off to another den that hasn't been inhabited for a few months, Mother Nature's kind of been doing some housekeeping while they're away. And if they do move, because there are so many youngsters and so many adults in this rapidly growing clan, there's a slight chance that they'll need to split up because they're not going to find a palace like this den site. This is a prime, prime example of a beautiful den site, and as Brian zooms out to show you the size and extent of this mound, you get a good idea of it now. Far larger than any of the other den sites that we've seen this Juma clan using. Ah, 
This is an applicable question from Yob Robin Yarrington on YouTube. You would like to know if any animals have ever made it into our house or accommodation areas. And we often have hyenas slinking into the kind of courtyard that is made up by the rooms at the DRC. There's a thin one meter passage that leads into about a 10 meter by three meter courtyard surrounded by semi-detached bedrooms. And we have hyena often waltzing in there trying to look for any titbits or leftovers. And so not into the rooms, but right in and amongst where we eat and sleep. And we had a puff adder that was found in Nikki and my bedroom just after we went on leave by Mama Z, our housekeeper. So snakes, James uh, Brent actually also had an awesome story. Uh, I mean, he walked back into the room after having, I think, a swim in the pool. Jamie was fast asleep in the middle of the day. And Brent saw a snake slithering up the bed towards her and had a small heart attack, but thankfully it was just a spotted bush snake or variegated bush snake, not a venomous snake. Um, so yes, yeah, snakes and spiders and scorpions will be in the bedrooms, but mammals, not common to find them in the bedrooms. The monkeys can prove problematic. They try and break into our kitchen and they have successfully, if somebody forgets to close the door, they make off with all of our fresh produce, leaving us stranded eating biscuits for the rest of the week. So, not so much the mammals. Um, as things dry out, we'll probably find that elephants are going to be spending more time in and our garden trying to break into the camps where there's a huge amounts of food, untapped resources that can be obviously a huge lure at this time of the year when there's not too much food around. So Robin, uh, usually not too many problems with uh, wild animals coming into our places. Hyenas are the probably most dangerous with regards to predators that could kill you if you leave your door open. I would, I think statistically they kill more people in Africa in that way than any other carnivore. If you're asleep, a hyena has got very little respect or fear for you. Whereas if you're awake, they will almost always bow down to you. If you chase them or shout at them, they will run off. Okay, well. I think we're going to keep this uh, high-paced mobile safari. No one in our camp slept well last night, and we can't understand why. But if we stay too long in any one place, you'd run the risk of finding us asleep like this. Is it? It's tiring if you just keep still without getting the wind in your hair. So we're not too sure why we're all tired, but we are. And in order to remain awake, we are going to keep moving and also keep looking for more animals. So thank you, hyena. You were very well behaved. Ah, uh, Chris in Arizona. And we've got one more little treat for you guys. There's a little bit of an outcast. Shame, what are you doing out here away from all your friends? Did you also have a rough night and just want to snoo snooze in the peace and quiet away from the den? This is a youngster, I'm guessing, possibly a year of age, in and around that point. It's actually possibly the one that came running past us. Oh, I'm told it's June, so not quite a year, a little bit under. So possibly June, possibly a little bit older, and I think it could have been the one that we saw come hurtling past us when we were with the lion. Chris, in Arizona, you'd like to know how long will hyenas usually spend at a den anywhere from a month to about three months would be their average stay at one point. And that's just in my history of these animals in this area. 
It can obviously vary greatly in other parts of Africa. And that's something that I try and urge and stress to all of you. The same species will potentially act considerably differently in different parts of Africa, even South Africa. Good, well, it appears we may have disturbed this individual's beauty sleep, so we're going to continue on. And I think I may use this little spot as a turning bay now. Hmm. Sharon in Pittsburgh. You've been doing some research on Crocutta Crocutta, the spotted hyena, and have established that the, the birthing process is not an easy one, especially the first birth that a hyena will go through. And the reason why the birthing process is difficult is that they give birth through what is a greatly enlarged clitoris. It looks like a penis, basically. And it's a very, very narrow canal with which to pop out a young hyena. And that is what causes the complications. Now, why have hyena evolved to have a problematic way of giving birth? Angaz. Angaz or angstuf means I don't know in Zulu, angazi, or angstuf in Shangan. What is it in Swahili again? I can't believe I've forgotten. Oh. I can't believe this word has slipped my mind. It's a very commonly used word along, uh, uh, amongst a lot of staff that I've worked with. Um, I cannot believe it. Anyway. If it comes back to me, I'll let you know the Kiswahili word for, uh, I'm not sure. Sijui! Sijui. Uh, thank you, Kirsty, who very quickly Google machined that for me. Um, Sijui is, I don't know, in Kiswahili. Um, Shanya, I mean, I'm no evolutionary professor, but you, you do, you know, naturally ask the question, why have such a, a, a successful animal evolved to, to this point, but it's got this kind of flawed reproductive process? Um, question that I cannot answer in full. If anybody else knows any kind of, or has any theories on that matter, please share them with us. Uh, love speculating and hearing all the many different theories and that is the beauty of safari is you simply do not know a lot of the the, the kind of guaranteed ways or, or, or reasons why anything has turned out the way it is a lot of the time it's merely speculation amongst different people adrenaline rush you would like to know who and why have these hyenas been named and i think it was just a collective decision uh, to give them very simple names uh, to be able to distinguish who's who and also keep track of when they were born um, obviously uh, on top of that that's the cubs then you need to know which one is their mother that's why their mothers were given names the other hyena in the clan haven't really been named but it's just to try and keep track of who's who um, and that's come uh, uh, with, with a lot of help from you guys. Um, helping with screenshots, keeping track of who's who as they grow up and develop. And it's really useful in terms of research. We basically are a, a joint researching company. Uh, all of us involved, you, the viewers, us, the people who are taking you to these places and keeping track of what's what and who's who, is going to provide very useful information. So for those of you who do go out of your way to spend a lot of your time archiving photos uh, that you've taken of the various animals, keeping track of who's who and when, it's, it's hugely, hugely useful information. And I think a lot of the time people forget that, you know, even though, yes, the African animals have been 
researched for, for many years to what degree, to what extent, by what people, you know, in what areas. There, there's so many uh, differences and kind of discrepancies that may have happened in research in the past that uh, we can try and fill those gaps now. So another big reason is simply for you guys, for our viewers. You know, we, we run a very different operation to that of a regular camp where your guests come in for three nights and aren't going to get to know the characters or the animals that roam this area as well as you guys do. It's a very, very different experience. Similar in ways, but hugely different in others. And that's why if I arrived there, or if Brent arrived at that hyena den this morning, even though it would be useful to say this cub was born in November and this cub was born in December, which all of the current guys probably won't be able to do, they're not going to be able to have kept track of the den nearly as much as we have, because we've got two vehicles, we're all sharing the information collectively between us. But it's not going to be that applicable to them. They're just going to be like, oh, cute, there's a hyena cub. It was born a couple of months ago. Enough said. Um, Whereas you guys tend to want more and want to understand more, which is great. Um, but having guests on the vehicle as a, you know, for a short period of time as opposed to you guys who can be on the safari indefinitely, and let's hope these safaris do continue until forever, infinity, um, it's naturally going to be a different experience that we are catering towards. And naming the animals is important for us to be able to deliver that experience. Okie dokes. As Jamie waits patiently in stealth mode, her senses must be heightened trying to work out where the sneaky unknown male leopard is gone. Uh, we're going to send you across to her. So Brace yourselves for stealth mode, and I hope you guys get lucky and just get a glimpse of this snap and another one to add to our list. Well, we are definitely in stealth mode here, and the reason why is that as we came down Hyena Road, a male in Yala right next to us was barking furiously, an alarm calling. So obviously he saw the leopard that we have yet to spot, and I thought I'd just stop and stand by here for just one moment and see if we've got, we're going to get lucky. I figured that by sitting absolutely still with our engine off, we might decide that he feels a little bit more comfortable. As you may be able to hear, however, James and the tracking team, the Mahindra doesn't really have a self mode. Although, funnily enough, the animals tend to be more comfortable with the sound of the diesel engine. And occasionally, we actually get a bit of a fright with our quiet petrol engines. Obviously, it has much less audio impact on the bush, but they are so accustomed to the sound of a diesel engine. And here comes Mr. Hendry now. I think he's going to come and have a quick chat with us about what we saw and what has been happening. I'm not sure he spotted us yet, to be honest. We are that much in stealth mode. No, he has now. He has now. Let's try and back out. I've been sitting here for the last five minutes. I don't think he's going to come out. Let's try and sneakily exit here as quietly as possible, which we're going to do highly effectively, including the right down to the squeak on the steering wheel. Going. Well, all right. Hi, James. Hi, Jim. How are you? <laughs> How very lovely to see both of you this morning. It is wonderful. We're so glad we bumped into you. Yeah. Um, he's gone straight. In. I, I don't know. I didn't see him, but then Yala was standing there going, boof. Okay. I'm sure it's him, but I think he's just going to keep, especially with, yeah, he's just going to keep running. Okay. Okay. I think I'm going to leave the area. I'm going to go find those elephants you were talking about. Me too. Enjoy. And that, ladies and gentlemen, I think is that. 
I'm heading back towards the Hussle Cut Line, not because I'm going to try and follow this leopard, but actually more because I'd like to follow up on those elephants that James saw. If, however, we bump into the leopard, then all the better for us. Bumpy, bumpy. Amazing, though, one thing I will say, Brent called exactly where that leopard was going to pop out. have a new viewer who's actually asked about the next animal that's on my planned list to see. Dakota's been watching for a week. Welcome Dakota, I'm glad you've stuck by us. And Dakota's saying, could you see elephants in the Slavi Sands? Because she hasn't seen any in the week that she's been watching. Dakota, absolutely yes you could, no doubt about it. There are plenty of elephants around. We just happened to, over the last few days, I think go through a bit of an elephant drought. I'm trying to think when I last saw an elephant. It was definitely quite a while ago. But Dakota, I, I can't promise you elephants. They might decide to go and wander across. Let's turn that down a little bit. Craig making his way towards the hyena then. Oh. And this road in particular, this two-track hyena road, is probably... When you get there, Inyala. This is the Inyala that was barking. Yes, it is too. There he is. And here we go. This is, I think this is the male Inyala that was alarm calling. He was on the other side of the road when I first saw him. At the moment, he's being a little bit camera shy, but he was the one with the eagle eyes, or in fact, maybe we should term that a little bit better, the prey species eyes and alertness that spotted the leopard. Now, Nyala, like a kudu, has this deep booming bark that they produce in the cavity of their chest, and it sounds a little bit like bah but much louder and I'm not going to do it now next to him because I feel as though he's had enough in the way of surprises for the morning. I don't think he needs to have my poor imitation of an alarm call added to it. Right now we just bumped into James and there is some apparent speculation in that respect as to who the lovely lady sitting on James's left was. I'm going to tell you, I'm wording this carefully, it is not James's girlfriend, that is Louise. Louise is one of our APs or our assistant producers in the same way that Jerry and Leanne both are. So she's not my sister and she's not James's girlfriend. But every now and again we actually happen to have Nikki and Kirsty on the ground as our two directors and then we have Leanne and Lou helping them out, giving them a chance to have a break every now and again. And what that means is that they have a chance, instead of spending their time in a room looking at the animals through the screen, to actually see the animals in person. So James is very, very, very good at kindly taking the ladies out to go and track things and find things. I believe last time he took Kirsty out, they found Tingana on foot eating a warthog. So yes. And I believe that the, the same question came through then with Kirsty being James's girlfriend. No, ladies and gentlemen, ladies in particular, that was not James's girlfriend. And I will say no more upon the subject. We shall let it rest and lie. Right, I've been completely distracted now. What was I doing? Oh, yes, I was talking about elephants. And I was talking about the question about whether or not we see elephants from Dakota. I promise you we will try and find you them today. I can't guarantee, given that it is a live safari, there's no such thing as scripting or planning your drive. You've just got to kind of bumble along and go with the flow. And I've found generally the drives that I've tried to plan have gone the worst. And the drives where I've just set out with no particular steps in mind have been the most exciting. Now, I want you to all carry on holding onto your seats and keep your leopard spotting eyes in your heads. Not that I can actually work out in, in hindsight what that sentence means, because presumably you would, anyway. Um, so yes, keep those leopard spotting eyes peeled. 
to see if we can find this male. There's still a chance that he might decide to pop out around Buffleshoof Boundary or Buffleshoof Dam. Safari Dean. Yeah. Safari Dean, carrying on with our profound and deep questions of the morning. Safari Dean would like to know what our spirit animal is, given that his might be a big cat because he saw the baby kudu. And instead of being filled with thoughts of cuteness and joy, which I have to confess I was, he was thinking about the possibility that it might make a meal for a big cat. So he says possibly his is the big cat um, spirit animal, one of them, presumably. Safari Dean, spirit animals. So difficult. You see, sometimes I think about wild dogs, um, but I'm not sure if that's a physical or a spiritual bond. They're just, wild dogs and myself are both not largely proportioned animals, let's put it that way. I was not born with the biggest bones or the largest muscles in the world. So in that respect, I feel as though maybe I relate to the wild dogs a little bit better. I also really, really enjoy elephants in terms of what gives me the greatest and most intense spiritual feeling, if we're going to put it like that. I'd probably be sitting with a herd of elephants. But right, oh no, you see it's difficult because spirit, spirit animal, whatever your definition may be, is not the same thing as your favorite animal. Baldy, what's your spirit animal? Okay, Billy says he hasn't been to a shaman yet, so he can't answer that until he does. He'll have to. Apparently, Scott has said his spirit animal. <laughs> I don't know whether I should let him tell you what he thinks his spirit animal is, or whether I should. No, I'm going to keep that as a surprise. We'll just have to. You'll just have to remind Scott to tell you what his spirit animal is. I don't want to give it away. Uh, my next approach would typically be to go up in Yala Road North in, in the hope of... Um, now I know that last time, I'm just rethinking this, sorry. Let me just put some thought into my process. Stand by one second, I just spotted something. And I almost want to, oh no, I got, I got overly excited. I thought I was seeing banded mongoose. I was not seeing banded mongoose. I was seeing little dwarf mongoose wandering around here. And now I can't spot one. Oh, there we go. In that termite mound just above there. I got, the reason I got so excited is because I thought they were banded mongoose. There you go, they're all racing around there. Lots of others coming up to join them. Not quite sure how I made that mistake out of the perif my peripheral vision because there's a huge size difference between these dwarf mongoose and the banded mongoose that I was talking about. The banded are much more unusual to see in this particular area. Oh, big group dashing about with their accompaniment every now and again, the flash of a fork-tailed drongo. Here you go, scurrying about. Now they will have enjoyed the brief rainy spell because it will give them a little bit more opportunity to catch some of the bugs and creepy crawlies and hojas that are wandering around. A hoja is a South African term for a bug or an insect, sort of generic descriptive term, a hoja. I call my cat hoja. You call your cat hoja? That's interesting. It's not a name, but... <laughs> Fium calls his cat affectionate term. The um, affectionate term for his pet cat is a hoja, or hoja. It's not actually her name, apparently, but she gets... It is a she, here. Yeah. She. Yeah. Did anybody else see that a mongoose chase the wood dove? Because I definitely did. The wood dove's back again. Definitely keeping out of their way, though. I don't think that the emerald-spotted wood dove would be on their menu. Little bit too big, but you never know. Mongoose are known for their courage and bravery. But yes, Liam's female cat occasionally gets called Hojas or Hoja, which is what our little dwarf mongoose are looking for. Cool. 
Nice little interlude. Now search. Most of the dwarf mongoose have disappeared into their burrow or a bit further up into the drainage line. Cute. Always an entertaining animal to see. Not my spirit animal though. Definitely not my spirit animal. spotted wood dove chase is actually something fairly unusual to see. Leanne was wondering, would a dwarf mongoose ever kill a mouse or a rat or something along those lines? And Leanne, yes, they, they probably would if they could catch them. They are the smallest. I'm so sorry about the steering wheel squeak. I've looked for Q20 and for WD40, so I'm sorry if it's disturbing you because it's certainly disturbing me. And unfortunately on Jigger, steering is quite an important factor. In fact, in most vehicles, the steering wheel is quite an important, important part of the vehicle. I'm going to give this a go. Apparently Je um, Brent drove up in Yala Road North with complete signal the other day. So let's see if we can manage this. In the meantime, Leanne, yes. That would probably, a mouse would probably be on a dwarf mongoose menu. I've never seen it occur. I've only ever seen them catch scorpions and bugs and things like that. But distinctly possible. And on the subject of the dwarf mongoose menu, Siberia Zumi was saying, well, if the emerald spotted wood dove was too big, and I, even then, you know, I'm not entirely convinced. I, I'm not sure that a mongoose wouldn't give it a go or think about giving it a go if they were hungry. But Siberia Zumi was wondering, would, if that wood dove is too big, are there other species of bird that a mongoose would eat? And the answer is yes, particularly when there are young bird species around. Maybe, for example, if they could be quick enough to catch a newly hatched Franklin, for example, would be a distinct possibility. Oh. I think I'm just going to stop here because I think if I go any further, I'm going to go black screen. But just have a look at this tremendous tree that has blocked the road. Not sure how our signal is doing. And the phenomenal red color that it looks like it's one of the albizia species. Oops, it's gone the most beautiful and that branch probably yeah, slowly died before that. collapsing. That's not elephants that have done that. It's split the tree in half. The green part is okay, the one ahead. that you can see up above. And then the tremendous red part that has blocked off the road. Awesome. Very cool to see, but a now new road is being cleared to make room for that. That's a very difficult tree to clear. Now, as you know, my phenomenal physical strength could be put to use in moving it. I think that would go incredibly well. Back up, we do apologize. Smiles for Rafi has said that the dwarf mongoose is her spirit animal. Smiles for Rafi, are you particularly tiny in size, or is there a reason why you feel as though the dwarf mongoose is your spirit animal? I would love to know. Now, I'm going to go through a signal dip. In the meantime, let's find out what Scott's spirit animal might be. So, spirit animals. <laughs> um, to be honest, I've, I'd never heard of a spirit animal before, so I asked Nikki and Kirsty to try and elaborate what exactly I'm supposed to be uh, looking for when it comes to a spirit animal. And Kirsty, I think, said something that touches my soul. 
And the first animal that came to mind was a sea anemone. Why, I don't know. <laughs> and that's probably why Jamie started laughing. <laughs> Gosh, I'm not too sure what my spirit animal is, um, but it's a good question. Possibly the rhino, I think. Um, an animal that we don't see here. Um, but yeah, I think possibly the, the, the rhino will be my spirit animal for the day. For those of you who, who know me a little bit better, I tend to chop and change my favorite animal uh, depending on the day and depending on my mood. Uh, I haven't been able to commit to any one, and I guess it will be the same for Safari Dean's question about the spirit animal. Sea anemones are very cool animals, though. I mean, them and the little Nemo fish, they've got something going there. Symbiosis, and both fascinating little creatures of the sea. Which brings me to the exciting future prospects of uh, the way this live safari company is going. And who knows, the future may allow for you to be going on some underwater safaris. Wouldn't that be fun? Dive live. So anything is possible. And I'm not, a, I'm not a snorkeler, I mean, a, a scuba diver. I don't have the necessary qualifications, but I've spent quite a lot of time underwater um, snorkeling. And it really is an incredible world underneath the water. And it'll be a fascinating, fascinating live experience. So that's something to look forward to. Susan in Brooklyn, from spirit animals to mythical animals. You would like to know if there are any specific mythical beasts of the Sabi Sands. Not that I know of, um, but there is one traditionally feared mythical beast called the Tokolosh. T-O-K-O-L-O-S-H-E, Tokoloshi. And it is feared by the local African inhabitants of this country, so much so that you can buy Tokolosh salt in various stores, which I've seen at green in colorations, like these green crystals, called Tokolosh salt. That's what it says on the label. Um, and you sprinkle that, I guess, around your house to keep the Tokolosh at bay. It must be a short creature. Obviously, one has never been seen like most, most mythical beasts. But the reason why it must be short and small is because the African uh, people of this uh, country believe that if you elevate your bed on two or three bricks, that will keep the Tokolosh at bay. They simply can't get to you. Um, so that's an interesting one. Um, Brian, any other mythical African beasts of South Africa that we can think of? Nothing's coming to mind for both of us, but we are racking our brains for anything else that is along that topic. I guess not so much a mythical beast, but a, a, a rare animal that does occur, but is very, very seldom captured on film is that of the black leopard. Um, not so much in the Sabi Sands, but in an area called the Waterberg, a little bit north of us. Apparently there have been a few confirmed sightings of these melanistic or black leopards there. Um, that would be something that I would love to see and almost, you could say, is a mythical beast because there's been so few sightings of them. So, <laughs> Wildebeest, uh, or AKA VM, which is his real name, uh, the cameraman teamed up with Jamie today, uh, said another mythical beast that roams the Sabu Sands is Dark Shadow. He has uh, given her the first name of Dark. We all know her as Shadow, but according to VM, that's her second name. It's her surname, <laughs> her first name being Dark. 
Uh, just emphasizing the way she slinks in and out of our view. Ooh. This is looking good. A tawny eagle and a battalure have just taken off. Great work on camera there, Bebop. I'm just going to creep forward. Oh, yes, my favorite. There's a fork-tailed drongo that looks like it's going to give this tawny eagle a hard time. And while you watch that, I'm going to be scanning the ground. There is going to be... Have I gone too far? Oh, sorry. Sorry, Brian. I'm so focused on trying to look for whatever it is that's attracted these leopards, uh, these eagles here. Yeah, there we go. That's a bit better. It's a pale form tawny eagle. And isn't that a wonderful, wonderful individual? Oh, no. No, this isn't making huge sense. If we look to our right here, Brian, on the ground, sorry, there's some impala walking straight through the scene, but they may not know that there's a predator here. I also saw a vulture further back that took off. Now, it's not uncommon for predators to remain unknown to new prey that could be passing by a given area. There you go, the impala, back to the tawny eagle. Where is the kill? Where is the predator that made the kill that is attracting both? Let's try and find you the other eagle, which was a battalure. And the fact that the two of them, two different species, were sitting right here indicates to me that something fishy is going on. Come on, please, can we be in luck? Virginia, you had a request earlier for us to try and find you some wild dog across here on Arethusa. And maybe it was them that have made a kill that these birds are wanting to scavenge. Where did the battalier go? Brian, they, did you see a battalier? There was one, yeah. Okay, so there was a battalier here as well. I did see a vulture fly out from another marula tree just before we came across the tawny eagle. Where? Oh, there's the vulture perched over there in a dead tree. I might need to spend some time on foot here, guys. It's just too thick to uh, feasibly explore from the road and from the vehicle. So I'm going to need to jump out and go for a walk here. Who knows, maybe the wild dog, maybe the Anderson male leopard. Wish us luck. And I'm going to very slowly peruse through this area on foot to try and work out what exactly has caused all of these carrion-eating birds to descend upon this area. Hopefully, we're going to have some good news for you in a short while. Over to Jamie. That's something that I thought about doing as well with this skittish leopard, was maybe trying to see if I could take a walk in and find him on foot. And I realized that it, if you're skittish with vehicles, he's going to be even more skittish with people on foot. And I've actually just decided for now to leave the area completely. Let him relax a bit, let him get used to us bit by bit, gradually over time, if he decides to stay in the area. So while Scott investigates what those carrion birds are, I've actually left my particular leopard sighting. Now this is where the elephants were this morning with James. They seem to have moved off and pulled a sneaky maneuver on us. Let's see if we can find them as we try and loop around. Sorry, Dakota. I will try and find them for you. I'm sure they're around here somewhere. I don't think they've moved off that fast. They probably thought about going to the of Dam and then realized that there were no possibilities of water there. Let's try going around here. I 
see that you were busy discussing mythical creatures with Scott and discussing the various folk tales and laws in Siberia. Zumi has said that she knows that there's a lot of tales around commonly seen animals or at least animals that actually exist that have been turned into mythical creatures and an example that she gave was the brown hyena. Now the thing that makes the brown hyena so perfect for that particular role of playing the mystic animal is their, first of all, their shyness. Just checking tracks here, sorry. First of all, their incredible shyness when it comes to moving about, particularly they're not nearly as bold as their spotted cousins. Their shape and the shagginess of them that gives them an almost werewolf type look and then the sounds that they make. Now, I know that, hair blowing in my face, I know that there's only been one brown hyena seen on a live drive with Peter Pretorius, so I'm going to assume that most of you have not had the opportunity to hear what a brown hyena sounds like. It makes the most unearthly, eerie sound. It, it's like people talking far away but close. I, I, I can't quite describe it. It's got a very human sound to it. It's not like the hyenas cackling, the spotted hyenas cackling laugh, although that in itself has a tremendous impact on people. But the brown hyena sound is like nothing I've ever heard before. I'll try and find a copy of it and play it for you on this afternoon's sunset safari. It's a really, really curious sound and they usually only vocalize in places where they feel absolutely comfortable in doing so. And I think that might be one of the things that led to the mythical creature story. Now, funnily enough, the first thing that came to my mind, and I, I don't know whether it's, it's some kind of traumatizing uh, memory from when I was at university in the UK, but when Scott mentioned mythical creatures, all I could think of was there was a song done by a group called Spitting Image, which dealt with hand puppets in the sort of 60s, 70s, and did a lot of political statements. And one of their songs was, I've never met a nice South African, and basically portrayed all of these mythical creatures that the singer had seen, but never meeting a nice South African. And that was something while I lived in the UK that was played to me pretty much on a, if not a weekly, not a daily basis, then definitely a weekly basis. But I have to say that nice South Africans, a hugely unfair reputation that comes from a darker time in our political history. Things are very different now and there are lots of nice South Africans. Liam's a nice South African. Here's our usual herd of, bachelor herd of water buck. And I'm taking this opportunity to just sit and listen to see if I can hear any elephants. Walt, I'm not sure if you're watching this morning. Walt was watching yesterday's sunset safari and was hoping for a nice screenshot of a water buck to add to his collection. Walt, I hope you're watching and taking screen screenshots if not maybe some of the other viewers could take screenshots in your stead i know that that will almost inevitably happen and share them on our safari live page and then we'll be able to share them with walt hopefully he's watching but if he's not i'm not sure where walt is from or where that puts him in the time zone deal but there you go walt this water buck sighting is for you They definitely are extraordinarily attractive animals. Those solid stocky bodies and the magnificent horns curving upwards and outwards above their heads. And as soon as those points or tips start to point inwards, that's when you know you've got a younger animal and they start to move outwards, you've got a mature bull. A beautiful bachelor herd, this one. There's at least seven, if not more, males in this group. Some of them more clearly visible than others. Yes, well, Walt, let us know if you're watching. Otherwise, what I'm gonna try and do is get another clear position so that some of the other viewers can take screenshots for you. Although I imagine, I'm not sure having 
apparently Walt was watching earlier. I imagine that it's sort of, there must be the satisfaction of taking your own screenshots, just like taking your own photographs. Oh, you were posing so nicely. Please do that head position again. He gave us a real model-like pose there as I drew up. A head tilted to the side. I'm not sure how, in a sort of, with a sort of wistful expression. Modeling those horns beautifully for us. Except now that he's what? Now he's wandered behind the raisin bushes. I don't think they're going to be screenshot cooperative this morning. I think they're going to stay hidden behind the trees. Sorry, Walt. We'll have to keep trying. Hopefully we'll catch a water buck when you are watching. And for all the others who are big fans of water buck as well. I can completely understand. They're very striking animals. The nice thing, of course, about this time of year is also We've been seeing so many different baby species of antelope between the baby waterbuck in particular that I, think I was thinking of and the one that James had while I was on leave looked like the most incredible sighting. And in that brief but lovely baby kudu sighting that we had this morning, there's more and more of them wandering around on wobbly legs. Sure. I wonder if this means this rain, this cloudy weather is going to blow away, or if it's just blowing more in. One of Brent's guests at Boyatella asked me last night if I thought it was going to rain more. And I had to tell him that at this point I have completely given up on predicting what the weather's going to do. There's no way that I expected it to drizzle like it did yesterday. on that the same page so smiles for Rafi I asked earlier we were talking about spirit animals and smiles for Rafi said that hers would have been a dwarf mongoose like the ones we were looking at and I asked for an explanation and smiles for Rafi said the other thing that she likes about dwarf mongoose is the fact that they settle their disputes through grooming competitions which is absolutely what they do so the alpha pair in a dwarf mongoose family are the only two that breed, with the odd exception, occasionally one of the subordinate females does breed with a much lower success rate in terms of survival for her pups. But when it comes time to determine status and rank within the mongoose family, they settle it by having a serious grooming competition until both individuals involved in this skirmish or dispute are coated in saliva and one simply cannot continue on any further. And that is the way that they solve their fights. It's wonderful the way that you can actually almost compare them to wild dogs. Dwarf mongoos can always be compared to wild dogs. They both have that alpha breeding pair and they both show very low levels of aggression within the group that's within their social structure. So agree, smiles, completely agree. I think it's a fantastic technique, that idea of a grooming competition. Although, I suppose we can just expand it to say they show affection to each other, an, an act that's affectionate, because I have to be honest, if I wanted to settle a dispute with somebody, having to groom them with, no, no, that's not appealing to me from a human perspective. <laughs> just, it's the, it's the human equivalent, or it's the dwarf mongoose equivalent of hugging it out. I'm hoping these eddies have popped through here somewhere because I'm sniffing them and smell them. Now we spoke about the smallest or the dwarf mongoose being the smallest predator of Juma and the Sabi sands. But Victor Perez was wondering, well if that is the case, what is the top aerial predator? of the skies and that's actually quite a tricky one to answer 
I'm going to give you a few, Victor. So the automatic answer that jumps straight into everybody's mind is the Marshall Eagle. It's our largest raptor species. It's our largest eagle species and capable of taking down even small antelope. Young impala, steenbok get regularly taken by something like a Marshall Eagle. And then just below that in terms of status, but not common in this area, in fact, pretty much hardly ever seen in this area, would be a black eagle or a rose eagle, which is second in size, but a completely different hunting technique. The reason I said I was going to give you a couple of examples is because raptors are so specialized in hunting different prey species. So the incredible rapid movement of a peregrine falcon, the fastest flight in terms of measuring in a dive, the fastest flight of any bird would be top of the, the, the bird species in terms of being able to catch something fast moving. Then you've got the snake eagles or something like a secretary bird that is far more specialized than a martial eagle would be in catching snakes. So it's just a matter of what exactly that particular bird species is specialized to do. Come on elephants. Really hoping that they're still in this block somewhere. I haven't seen their, I saw their tracks coming in here. I didn't see them coming out. I'm keeping my fingers crossed they're going to be here somewhere. For Dakota and for myself actually. I haven't seen elephants in a long time. In terms of raptor species, and then of course there's the scavengers. And once you get to the scavenging species, the vulture species, then you've got a completely different hierarchy altogether. A leopard, something like a leopard-faced vulture, which is one of the largest vulture species in the world, has got that immensely powerful thick beak or bill and is capable of tearing open carcasses and also capable of scaring away other bird species that might be in the area. in Long Island, you were actually asking about the very bird that I mentioned earlier. So you've actually answered your question in asking if there's any peregrine falcons. Evie wants to know what is the fastest bird in South Africa and the answer in that particular instance and as I said it's specific to the diving speed. Ah they've crossed this block already. Okay well that gives me another place to go and look for them. Some more possibilities to find them. Evie, in terms of speed, yes, a peregrine falcon in full dive can reach speeds well over 250 odd kilometers, if not more. So that puts it at speeds of well over 100 miles. Yes, we do get them here. I haven't managed to get them on camera yet on our live safaris, but it's still something that I would be aiming to do. It's, they're a bit more unusual than the more common species of falcon, like for example, the Amur falcon that we see on a fairly regular basis. I'm just trying to think there's a bird and Evie I have to rack my brains back to when I was a kid and reading up all about the different birds top speeds. The peregrine flight is measured in, the, in terms of its dive but there's another bird species that has the fastest sort of straight flight so rather than diving in the way that peregrines do is a, a, as if as they are normally covering ground flapping their wings or gliding and there's a bird species that is considered to be the fastest in that respect is it a swift or a swallow it's going to bug me terribly i wonder if any of our regular viewers would be able to answer that i'm not talking in south africa i'm talking in the world and there's a bird species that is considered the fastest flying bird as opposed to the fastest diving bird. Back to Buffelzook Dam. We spent a lot of time here this morning. Keep your eyes peeled for our secretive leopard while we go through. And let's see if we can catch up with those elephants on the other side of this block. in New York, he 
wants to, an answer to his son's question. His son Gary and his friend JB are doing a project on birds and they want to know if there are any robin species in South Africa. And I'm actually going to stop and I'm going to show you some pictures because yes, there are indeed robins in here. Now our most vocal and wonderful birds that we often hear chirping away in the bushes are the robin species. They have a wonderful song, so just bear with me one second. Keep your eyes peeled for the leopard. You never know. We might get lucky. You might wander across in front of us while I find you some pictures of different robin species. Sorry, just have to remember how pages work. Sure. Okay. There are so many different types of robin species that it's almost difficult to know where to begin. Let's start with this little guy here. We've got the bearded scrub robin. You might even get to see a brown scrub robin, although I'm fairly certain, not sure if we've managed to get those on cameras yet. But just to give you a rough idea, I'm not going to go through every species in terms of robin species because there are so many. But I'll just turn the page and you can see how many different robins there are throughout Africa and a lot of them occur within the Sabi sands. This is stone chat, so that's not quite what I'm looking for. I'm also looking for scrub robins. Let's just see if there's more here. There's some forest robins for you. There are so many different species of robins, and these are the ones that are so incredibly vocal. This one you might get to see, the red-capped robin chat. We're right on the fringes of its territory. What I'm looking for in particular is the white-browed scrub, scrub robin. It's somewhere in this selection of white-browed robin chat. There we go, that's the one I'm looking for. Beautiful vocal little bird. Makes the most wonderful sounds in the bushes, but you hardly ever see them. It's far more common to hear them than it is to see them. But I know that I'm not sure exactly where you are in terms of where the viewers from, where that question came from. But I know that in the UK in particular, the robins are famed for their beautiful little songs and those wonderful red breast colours that they have on them. So just taking the opportunity to listen for these elephants. They're somewhere here. Now the question came from New York. I'm less familiar with the American birds than I am with the European birds, obviously having spent more time in Europe. But I know that there are robins in America as well. There must be lots of, presumably there are as many different species as we have different species here. We'll have to, I have to rely upon the viewers to educate me about the different robin species of America. duck around this buffalo thorn and make sure not to pierce all the beast's ears. I'm sure you're all wondering how Scott's search went, so let's hear it from him exactly what happened there. Well, not the predators we were hoping on finding, but still a majestic antelope, the kudu. And that's a great example of how well their vertical white stripes help their bodies to blend in to the typically thick environment that they move through, feeding on leaves. Although during the drought, they may find themselves feeding on grass, which it looks like that one may be doing, unless it's just feeding on a very small leafy shrub that's low to the ground. But basically those vertical white stripes help chop their body up into puzzle pieces, helping them dissolve in thick bush. Also a couple of impalas there following behind, safety in numbers. And then a nest of a bird right at the top of this knobthorn tree straight in front of us. You may see the silhouette of the vulture as Brian just levels out the camera. There we go. And I know you've been talking about a lot of different birds of prey with Jamie. 
These ones are sadly threatened and the numbers have been declining rapidly over the years. Sadly, poisons that farmers use and traditional medicine and traditional healers strongly seek out the body parts of vultures. They are used a lot in traditional medicines, as are the parts of a lot of wild animals, sadly. So that's causing their numbers to, to dwindle. But great to see that this white-backed vulture is at least doing its bit to try and increase their population. It's a pity we can't see any more into the nest. My selfie stick, sadly, is slightly too short to reach up in there to give us a bird's eye view, which we have done before for getting the bird's eye view into little nests. Now, we walked around the area where I was hoping to find a predator with a kill because of the fact that there was a tawny eagle, a battalier eagle, and a vulture all in that area, but came up with absolutely nothing. There was impala that we saw. They continued to feed through that area unperturbed. There was even a wildebeest that came through unperturbed. So. Maybe it was merely a false alarm. But maybe there was just something small that was dead, like a tiny little dead animal that I didn't see that didn't necessarily get killed by a predator and therefore may have been difficult to spot, but that may, may have been what caused them to be there. We will never know. As I got off the vehicle, some impala started rutting and snorting, which is strange at this time of the year, but that got Brian and I very excited that there was a predator around. Siberia Zumi, hello and welcome. You would like to know which is the biggest owl in the Sabi Sands. And let me just get it in my book for you. It is the Varro's Eagle Owl. Um, so the smallest e uh, owls are the Bard and Pearl Spotted. And because they are small, so small, they've got Owlet at the end of their name. And they're only about 20 centimeters in length, which is about nine inches, you could say. And then the big daddy of the owls of this area is the Varro's eagle owl, which is 62 centimeters, three times taller than them, and considerably larger. They are capable of catching monkeys. It's this individual over here. Small antelope, snakes, but we'll also feed on smaller rodents. It used to be called the giant eagle owl until its name got changed to the Varro's eagle owl. And we do see them here from time to time. Very distinct pink eyelids you may have noticed there. This one here is the Pearl's fishing owl. This is probably the most rare owl to see in South Africa. And as its name suggests, it is a specialist in catching fish, but also small crocodiles and frogs have been recorded to be in their meal plan. Good, there we go, Siberia Zumi. The sun's beginning to try and poke through the clouds. I mean, it's not even nearly there, but just give you a quick update as to what's going on. You can see it's making an effort to bust through. Maybe this afternoon we'll have blue skies. I'm hoping, though, that it stays nice and cool and cloudy. It is beneficial for us and the vegetation. The less heat, the less evapotranspiration that occurs. And we need as little of that to go on during this drought as possible. African wildcats occur here in the Sabi Sands. Technically they do, but I've never seen one. And I've been driving around here for whew, close on four and a half years now. So 
and not just me, I've had very few colleagues to have ever seen one, if any, that I can think of. Caracal and serval, though, yes, they do occur here, not in huge quantities, but they have been seen. Not, I've never seen a caracal here, I've seen a few serval. But African wildcat never, and it's interesting because further north of here, not very far north of us in the Timbavati, they're quite common. And for those of you who don't know what an African wildcat is, it's basically looks like a domestic cat. It's got quite kind of a lot of stripes, but it's the size of a domestic cat, essentially. And I'm sure a lot of you, you know how domestic cats work. Some take on the pairs of quite a wild looking creature, and that's essentially what the African wildcat looks like. I can do better than verbally trying to explain what they look like by finding you one. So let's rather do that quickly. All right. There we go. So, there we go, that's an African wildcat. If you saw that in your neighbor's house, you wouldn't think it is necessarily an African wildcat. You may just think it's a variation of the many domestic house cats you get around the world. Good. And Eddie Abbey, you'd like to know if there are any domestic cats living here in the Sabi Sands. Not that I've ever seen. Um, I don't think they'd last very long. I think they would be consumed fairly quickly by the wild cats that live here or by any, anything really. Um, not a good place to raise domestic animals unless you are happy to deal with the fact that they could be consumed by something. I've only actually ever seen an African wildcat once though. Um, it was an epic sighting. I actually managed to get out on foot and photograph it from some low angles in the Kalahari Transfrontier National Park. I need to try and fish out those photos from a long lost archive. It's an incredible transfrontier park that stretches into Namibia and Botswana. Um, there's a heel of South Africa, uh, kind of in the northwestern portion of our country, that kind of resembles a stiletto, a heel of a shoe. And it's right in the top little corner of that strange little portion of our country where the Kalahari. Uh, Transfrontier Park occurs, and it's, like I say, a magical spot. Now, we are driving along the western boundary of Arethusa. This is the area where we could find the Anderson Mail. It's as far as the territory really stretches into our area of traverse. So wish us luck, and while we continue here, you guys are going to go off and find some views of one of Africa's largest mammals. Enjoy. It's amazing how for the largest animal, it's incredible the way that elephants can disappear into the bush. But Dakota, I have managed to find them and they are moving steadily in our direction, slowly but surely, stopping to have their morning breakfast snack. And of course, elephants being close on between two to six tons need pretty much constant feeding. They also don't have the world's most effective digestive systems. Believe it or not, they're probably at their closest about 30 meters away from us. It just goes to show how dense this vegetation is. You can just see large lumps of gray moving in between the trees, and the odd leg and the odd trunk. But this is just a question of having a little bit of patience and waiting for them to come to us. The vegetation is so dense that if I try and off-road towards them, they're just going to move straight away from me. The other reason for my assessment in that particular instance is the fact that when I was tracking them for Dakota and all of our other elephant lovers, I noticed that there are some tracks of really, really tiny babies. There you can see a youngster moving in the back. <laughs> what are you doing? What are you doing? Up to no good. I wish we could see exactly what that little elephant is up to. Probably chasing something small like a Franklin. Come on, Ellie's. Come say hello. Out 
it's just a question of waiting for them to come to us. There's a couple, it's quite a large herd actually, there's quite a few in this block. Here we go. One of the larger females looking at us, munching away. Come on, girl. Bring your family to come say hello. Nope. Distracted by whatever it is they are munching on. There's another large male, actually. He might come and say hello to us. Hello, big boy. Nope, he's going to hide there. I'm going to move forward a little bit. We should be able to see a nice clear view of this ball. of a male elephant. One of those tricky animals to tell the difference of. It's been a bit of a theme for us this morning about males and females. Elephants are one of the more difficult of the animal species, particularly when it concerns a young male or a young female, because elephants' testicles, for an animal that size, cannot be contained outside of their body. They have to be internal. So an elephant's testicles sit up around its kidneys. He is using his trunk to get to some nice perennial plants hidden in the shade of that tree. But this gentleman has nice thick broad tusks and a rounded forehead compared to the sharper profile of a female. And when you get to see a nice view of a female, I'll show you what I mean. But have a look at the way that his forehead curves nicely in an almost concave shape. So if you ever get, find yourself in a position, which is really common, where, you see a, where you're looking at elephants in thick bush, and you want to tell the difference between male and female, that is one of the good distinctive differences. The female profile, the female forehead is much sharper. There you go. See, slowly, slowly coming towards us and out onto the road. What's up, boy? Are you going to come and cause nonsense? Uh-uh. I don't think that's a very good idea. Yes, you move that tree. You get to those nice sheltered plants there. He gave us a slight head shake as a young male, and I think he is very young. He's got nice rounded temporal regions. There's a chance he's going to come up and stay alone. That's, in fact, exactly what he's going to do. I think he's going to come and make himself look big and scary. There's nothing to be worried about. There's no aggression in his body language. The young males just tend to be a bit more curious. Hey, boy. Oh, not feeling, not feeling so curious today. Very important to respect the body language and the what the elephants are telling you in terms of their response to you. I'm going to move forward and turn around because they've decided to all cross behind me. Let's see if he's going to let me do that. He stopped right behind me. Sorry, boy. Do you mind if I just turn around? Almost got our positioning exactly right. I'm very glad that we managed to find these elephants for you before the end of our sunrise safari. Nothing better than a peaceful elephant sight. To Safari Dean's original conversation. I completely agree with Safari Dean. Sorry, boy. About the fact that he says elephants are his zen spirit animal. 
I think most of us feel exactly the same way, Safari Dean. There is something very peaceful about an elephant sighting. The amount of wisdom and the thoughts that they have. There's so much going on in those brown eyes in terms of thought process and analyzing and weighing up the situation. Just creeping forward slightly. Hey boy, you're blocking our view of the rest of the herd. I know, I know. It's okay. A relaxed elephant sighting to me is probably one of the most peaceful experiences that the bush has to offer. And it's such a privilege that they feel as comfortable as they do in the space of our vehicle. It's always important to let the elephant come to you. And then you get to enjoy views like this, where you can look right into his mouth. Here's his tongue coming forward. The lower the lip. You hardly ever get to see a lower lip of an elephant. Watch him crunch away at one of our thorniest trees. Is that nice, boy? Some fresh buffalo thorn. I might be imagining it, but it almost seemed as though he was really enjoying that particular mouthful. He's a young boar. He's only just sort of about 15 to maybe coming up to 20, but I think he's even younger than that. He's going to be a big gentleman when he's older. And he's right on the boundary of his herd at that age where it's going to be time for him to leave and move off on his own. Look at those thick tusks. I think when he grows older, he's going to have a very impressive set of ivory. And those tusks, of course, being, oh, look at that eye. But yes, those tusks being modified in size of teeth. They are essentially just teeth. But such a wonderful, interesting modification that the elephant has. That combined with that dexterous, versatile trunk. And then using them in combination, you can even see the groove on that tusk on the left of your screen from where he's pulled and broken. Here he's going to do it again using it to snap the branches that he's feeding on. A concertina-like trunk working in perfect unison. Thank you, gorgeous. You are very handsome with your lovely long eyelashes. Oh, really interesting. Scott's got an unusual bird for your bird list. Let's have a look before it flies. We've just spotted a female black cuckoo shrike. It's a rare bird, and that's why I'm desperate for you guys to try and get a view of it to add to your bird lists. Where have you gone? Let's keep creeping along, yeah? Sounds like you're having a great time inside the mouth of an elephant bull. Hmm. We've just passed the Arethusa waterhole, nothing to really see. There was a fish eagle that kept dodging us. We tried to get you some views of it, but it wasn't interested. Okay, I think the cuckoo shrike has evaded us, but what I will do is just show you a quick picture in the book. And what's interesting is that we had the female. We had this individual over here. Um, whereas the male looks completely different. Black with that little yellow shoulder part. Then you also get this slight variation of the black cuckoo shrike. Next time we will get it. And maybe we'll spend a bit longer here in this area and see if we can't whistle it out. Anyway, you guys are going to head back to the elephant now. Enjoy. One of those joys of live wildlife for me, you never know if the animal's going to stick around or not. Oh, what have you got uh, there, Mr. This young elephant standing guard. 
with his stick. <laughs> oh, yes, you're very scary. I'm very intimidated. <laughs> Little male. I love it when calves are at this age. They're starting to experiment with their boundaries and with our boundaries. So those ears out is to show just how big and scary they really are. Yes. Until they realize that mom has moved away. At which point it's time to, it's time to move off. <laughs> I would take my stick and go. <laughs> Look at that indecision. That backwards and forwards swaying of the foot is a really good indication. This little boy, he actually wants to play. He wants to play with us. And that's where the indecisiveness comes in. And there's so much in the little nuances of elephant body language, whether it's the twists of their trunk or the movement of their feet or their tail, can tell you so much about what their intentions are. Nope, decided that snacking is more important. See if we can inch closer, get a view of the rest of the herd at the same time. And after step. Oh! Cross elephant. What's up, elephant? Somebody's trumpeting away in the bushes. Might actually be chasing something like kudu. I did see kudu moving through. For some reason, elephant can be quite, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Moody. Moody. Moody is probably a good way of describing it. Okay, little boy. Let's try and get a bit closer. Yes, it's okay. Oh, his tusks are just coming through. Here we go. Oh! Still an angry elephant somewhere in the bushes. A cross calf, maybe. Sounds like a baby to me, squealing like that. They're going to come through. I'll just keep an eye on what's happening on that side. None of the other elephants reacting in any way negatively. So they're not hugely stressed. I wanted to be able to get a little bit closer to show you this little one's eyes. And in fact, the stumps of his tusks coming through. So it puts him in close to three years old. Just between two and a half, coming up to three. But Zumi... Jody was actually wondering about the color of elephants' eyes, and I was going to try and reposition to show you. But you were wondering if all elephants have brown eyes. The answer is yes. They have a beautiful hazel-colored iris. And it's what goes beyond that is the, the way in which they look at you. When they look at you, there's... When you look at them, maybe, is a better description. When you look at them, there is... Very much to me, personally, there's very much a sentient being looking back at me. Hello, boy. You're a sneaky one. He's right behind us, so I can't actually reposition for now. We'll just have to make do. Oh, we made it good. Here we go. He's a sneaky boy. See how he favors that right tusk? Or the, t the tusk on the left of your screen? giving a very clear indication that in this particular elephant he is very much right tusked dominant just like some people are right handed hello boy they are such wonderful animals Patricia Robinson was enjoying the close up of that elephant bull's mouth that we heard earlier we heard, we saw earlier and was saying that she loves the chin whiskers on the elephant. I completely agree. I think it's a hugely attractive feature of theirs, their little beards. And of course, so important in terms of their sensory input. They have a blind spot directly in front of their face and around their chin. So they can't see. Everything that they do is based on feel. That's why the little one is being so brave. Sorry, Patricia, I'll be with you in a moment. That's why little one was being so brave. Mommy was just behind the trees. What a lovely sighting. Surrounded by Africa's and the world's largest land mammal. 
I chatted earlier about the baby antelope species we're seeing. I'm going to try and find your baby elephant. In the meantime, Scott has found a baby waterbuck. Now, you can see the mother. She's facing us. The baby is directly behind the green bush that's in front of the mother. You can very faintly make it out. There we go. The grey go away bird calling behind us. And I'm hoping what's going to happen is this little young waterbuck is going to start missing mommy and come running back into the open clearing where we can see it. Here it comes. It is so cute. Let me see if I can't roll back a bit. There we go. Ooh, not too much. Look at how tiny it is. It's got a tiny little ring on its bottom. And it's a little bit shaky on its legs, it looks like. Who knows when it was born, but it is absolutely minute. So I'm going to try and move forward a bit. Oh, no. Just trotted off a few steps there. It's going quite far away from its mother, surprisingly. Its mother's kind of looking at it in a fairly concerned nature, but it's being inquisitive, as most young animals are, discovering the weird and wonderful things that it is going to become acquainted to. But it doesn't seem too interested in becoming acquainted with the camera. Look at mom looking on very caringly and almost cautiously, wondering, is it straying a little bit too far? Oh, I think it's may have found a spot to lie down there, or am I imagining things? What are you doing? Some southern grey hornbills calling. Nearby, that's the noise you can hear. And I think we're in luck. I think there's some papachai daves, which is a parrot dove, or a, officially known as a green pigeon, not too far away. There's one to our right here, and they're birds we don't get to see very often, so... Oh, no, just flew, flown off. Sure, well done, Brian. They're fast-flying birds. Um, there's some go-away birds up in this tree that Brian's zooming into now, I think, while I'm dreaming. Are these two starlings or are these go-away birds? No, they are. I think they're starlings. I can't see clearly, but it sounds like... Oh, the red-billed buffalo weavers. There we go. At least we've solved that myth. The water bucks disappeared and the baby elephant is performing over on with Jamie's vehicle, so you're going to rush across back there. This elephant is being absolutely hilarious. So he's lying down on the side of a termite mound, but unlike the way that they usually lean against termite mounds, he's actually got his head facing downwards and can't get comfortable. Help. Oh, do you see too many spikes and things? Put its head up. <laughs> Come on, baby, you can do it. Up you get. <laughs> and just, just in case he wanted to get up, a youngster came to investigate and pushed him over again. Come on, little one, you can get up. You can get up. Mom coming from behind to investigate, or one of the adult females to investigate. I think, do you know, that cry that I heard earlier. I wonder if this Ellie hasn't fallen. I don't think so, though. I think he's just found himself in a really awkward position, and now Buddy's not really helping at all. Now, I know it's not the best view. Look at this. Look at this. Pushing the youngster out of the way. This is fascinating. This is our best view. For now. Oh, almost, almost. Hold on a sec. I'm going to try and move forward. I'm a little bit, I'm actually 
almost a bit concerned that this elephant is stuck. But I think he's managed. Yep, there we go, there we go. Up you get. Oh no, they're all lying down now. What on earth is going on? There we go. Almost. Bottom up. Come on. You can do it. <laughs> okay, no concern needed. Just an elephant that got stuck. Oh, you silly creature. He moved forward because now that female that climbed on top of them, well, the older elephant that climbed on top of them, is now also lying down. Now, now the one is climbing on top of the other. This is one giant game that the youngsters are engaging in. I had a brief moment of concern, but they're now climbing on top of each other. Let's see. I had an elephant in front of me earlier. Let's see. How's that, Ruby? A little bit more. A little more. Get faster. Get faster. Let's go here. can't actually go any further. This has been probably one of the most entertaining elephant sightings I've ever had in my life. And now? And now? What are we all playing up this morning? This elephant just knelt on the ground in front of me. It's chaos here at the elephant herd, family. Yes, little boy. You are very scary. This has been incredible. Oh, there's too much going on now because now the other elephant is climbing on top of where the elephants are lying down in one massive pachyderm pile. I don't know where to look. <laughs> oh no, this is hilarious. I can almost guarantee, now looking at them like this, there we go, I've found a comfortable spot, I'm going to lie on you. This is three young males. And it just goes to show how incredibly tight those bonds are in a herd. What's gotten into you lot? Have you been eating funny mushrooms or something? All the elephants behaving very strangely a trio of pachyderms in a pile. Now here he goes again, look Wilby. Here he goes again. Uh, okay, and up again. Fair enough. I don't, I don't even begin to know. I think that was meant to be intimidating. I think he was showing me how incredibly well he can kneel down on his ankles. Fair enough. Okay, we're back again to our elephant pachyderm pile. I'm going to escape from the circus. Uh, no, that's what they seem to be. <laughs> VM says he thinks they've escaped from a circus. <laughs> they are certainly putting on an incredible act for us this morning. Dakota, I really hope you're still watching. I really, really do. Because this has definitely been, hands down, one of the most entertaining elephant sightings I have ever had in my life. A girl girl was on the same page as I was. She said that whatever they've been eating, she wants some as well. <laughs> oh, somebody gave the kids too much sugar. Monkeys. <laughs> Monkeys alarm calling. Mm. Oh, so many things. As we're coming to the end of our sunrise foray, I can't race off now to follow the alarm calling monkeys. All that little one wants to do is sleep and <laughs> just not being allowed the opportunity. Here we go, finding a comfortable headrest. In the meantime, back to the front of the road, just to expand on what's happening here. Our elef young elephant bull that wants to come and... Oh, there we go, that's what I wanted to show you. Here's a tiny little weeny one at the back. Could well be the one that screamed like that. Uh, 
And there's our young bull that's on our left who's decided to try and creep up closer in interests of intimidating us. Still looking at us out of the corner of his eye. I see you too, boy. And then our tumbling pachyderms on a termite mound. Our circus performers are now having a rough and tumble game. Almost definitely young males. Oh, and it's time to go. The adults have put their foot down. Somebody communicated something. Hello, old girl. I'm not doing anything to your babies, I promise. I'm just sitting here watching their antics. Here we go. A procession of elephants. Here come our young mischief. Oh, oh, I'm going to do a dance. I'm going to do a pirouette. I want to be famous. I want to be famous on screen. Now I'm going to come and scare you. Yes, very scary. Head out. Head up, ears out, trunk up. Very intimidating. Come on, do another dance for us. <laughs> Whoop, backing up. Backing up. It's so funny how the females, the cows of this herd, have not paid them the slightest bit of attention. It has just been entirely like indulgent grandmothers and mothers watching the shenanigans of their youngsters with a patient eye. Here comes a fighting group. Oh, no, nope, they've just stopped. Some older bulls having a bit of a disagreement. Mike Costa is a little bit concerned about our safety. Mike, I promise you we're not in a dangerous situation. They are perfectly relaxed. The best way to judge an elephant herd mood is to look at the females. The females couldn't give a jot that we are sitting in the middle of their herd. They've just concentrated on feeding and leaving the games and the goings on to the youngsters. And that's all that's happening here. They're just playing. That's all that they've been doing. So sitting in the middle of an elephant herd, they came to us. They slowly moved around us. Oh, every now and again, there's a bit of a burp from one of the elephants. This has been phenomenal. What an incredible elephant sighting. I'm glad that we stayed to see it to its conclusion. Dakota, I hope that you enjoyed that. It was definitely one of my best ones. Right, guys, we're coming to the end of our sunrise safari, and it seems as though our action is winding down in completion. So thank you all for joining us. We do apologize. Our dam cam isn't working. We are going to be up and running as soon as we possibly can. Our tech guys are working on it. Thank you, Viam, the wildebeest, for his wonderful camera work. And I'm going to say thank you on behalf of Scott and Dave as well. Have a wonderful day wherever you are in the world. I hope that you've enjoyed it. And we will catch up with you this afternoon for the sunset safari. Cheers, guys, and thanks for joining us.